All right, so let's imagine we're interested in the relationship between, I don't know, um, exercise and heart disease. Um, let's say more specifically, we're interested in the relationship between plain squash and the reduced likelihood of heart disease. Well, there are a couple of ways we can think about um, testing this hypothesis. We've learned one way. Uh, we could treat this as a binary dependent variable, this being plain of squash. Uh, we could go around and asking go around asking people whether that whether or not they play squash and code that as a zero or a one. Zero means this person does not play squash. One means they do. And then track their uh, their uh, incidence of heart disease over a course of some period of time. And we can make some predictions about the uh, the effect of squash on uh, heart disease. But that's a crude indicator. The truth of the matter is that simply playing squash is not probably, it's not really exactly what we're interested in here. Actually, what we're really interested in understanding is, does the deg the amount of squash you play, does the amount of time you spend engaging in the activity of squash, is that associated with reduced heart disease? Um, that's sort of an indirect way of saying that we're sort of interested in understanding the relationship between a continuous uh, independent variable and some sort of outcome measure. Uh, so while the tools we've used up to this point, t-tests and ANOVAs, etc., are useful for that categorical independent variable, it's not going to do us very well, do us much good here if what we're looking at understanding is whether playing more squash um, is is helpful in reducing the likelihood of heart disease. The better test is something like: Is there a relationship between the number of hours per week a person plays squash? and the incidence of heart disease. So that would give us a null hypothesis that there is no relationship between the number of hours a week playing squash and the incidence of heart disease. So then the question is, how do we test that? Um, we can run a regression to test this. Regression is pretty neat. Um, imagine we follow, I don't know, 10,000 people. We tra track their squash playing habits. Um, and we find, uh, so we track how many hours per week of squash they play, and we average that out over some period of time. And then we uh, uh, gather data around whether or not they've got heart disease. And imagine that we, we use a regression, which I'm going to show you in just a few minutes. Use a regression and find that each additional hour of squash that a person plays per week is associated with a 1% decrease in the likelihood of contracting heart disease. Um, and that it's a statistically significant relationship, p equals 0, 0. 0.000. Uh, so that's cool. Um, so regression allows us to do that test. Um, mechanically, it's very, very similar to um, a t-test in ANOVA in the sense that you just point Genova, Jamovi to the independent and the dependent variable. Uh, practically speaking, the, the approach is a little bit different. Um, I'm not going to get too far into the mathematical weeds here, but effectively what the statistics are doing um, this is a linear regression. We're pre predicting, we're trying to determine whether or not a linear relationship exists between one variable and another. And we do that by examining the covariance of the two variables, the covariance of the um, uh, independent variable and the variable, uh, and the dependent variable. Um, and I think that's, that's great and that's useful and that's really, really cool. Um, but this particular example allows us to explore another really cool feature uh, associated uh, with regressions. And that's what is the really the core issue with this particular test. Um, if you were to present these data, these findings, um, a, a, good, a good statistical thinker would very instinctively respond that, well, there's a problem with that. That, that is confounded. That is, the number of hours a person spends playing squash is confounded with some other variables that might actually be contributing to the dependent variable of interest. Um, for example, um, turns out playing squash is highly correlated with income and socioeconomic status. And if you think about this, it makes sense. Squ squash courts are mostly at private clubs, and people who spend a lot of time playing squash probably have flexibility of time and the money to be a part of a private club. Um, and we have some evidence that heart disease is associated with income and socioeconomic status. And maybe a variety of reasons for this, but one big one is because of diet, the, the types of food that uh, wealthier or higher income people are able to eat and or other lifestyle choices. And so a critical 
consumer of evidence is immediately going to pounce on your results, your regression results, and say, well, um, squash, the plane of squash is highly correlated with income and socioeconomic status. Have you controlled for income or socioeconomic status? And that's the cool thing about regression is it allows us to include other covariates, other variables that might co-vary with our independent or dependent variable of interest. We can include them in the regression and we can predict the effect of one covariate, our independent variable of interest, on the outcome while controlling for these other covariates. It's a way of stripping out the effect that's associated with, in this case, income or socioeconomic status, and see if after we account for that effect, is there any effect remaining associated with the amount of time that a person plays? And that's pretty cool, because it turns out that lots of things are correlated with lots of things. It turns out a lot of the stuff that we're really interested in understanding about organizations about people and organizations, the measures that we have available to us or that we're interested in testing, it is quite often the case that those are highly correlated with other measures that might themselves be associated with the outcome of interest. We have to control for that effect if we're going to do these analysis correctly and have any confidence in the insights um, from our regressions. So the cool thing about regression is it allows us to add other covariates in the model. It allows us to estimate a relationship while controlling for the effects of other known predictors of the outcome. Um, and if we find a statistically significant relationship after controlling for income or socioeconomic status, um, we then can reject that null hypothesis and we can say that we, we find evidence to reject the null hypothesis between squash and plain, uh, squash plain and heart disease even after controlling for income and socioeconomic status. So now I want to take a minute and, and open up Jamovi, and we'll spend a few minutes just doing an example, just to make sure we understand the mechanics of working in Jamovi with regressions. All right, we've got uh, Jamovi open here. I'm using our same data set we've been using the whole time. And we're going to do a very simple regression, and I'm actually not going to do a regression with a continuous independent variable. I'm going to use a uh, categorical independent variable, uh, only because it'll help explain the interpretation a bit easier. Um, it turns out that regressions, you can use uh, regression for uh, categorical independent variables as well. It's not just for continuous independent variables. Um, and to, so to, to do a regression, we're going to click up here in regression and we're, we're for the moment, we're going to focus on linear regressions, linear regressions. So there are a few other types of regressions. Um, Logistic regression is one that is often used. Logistic regression is useful if you're trying to predict a binary outcome. For example, whether someone quits or not. So whether somebody actually departs or not. If your outcome measure is a binary measure, um, you can uh, use a you can uh, use a binomial logistic regression, two outcomes, um, or multinomial if there's multiple categories. Ordinal is if there if you're dependent variable is a uh, categorical variable, but that is ordered. So um, maybe the number of publications a faculty member has or something like that. We're not going to worry about this right now. Just keep that in the back of your mind. The mechanics of this setup is exactly the same. If you get there, there's a little bit of behind the scenes math that works differently that we might discuss at a future date. For the moment that we're going to look at linear regression and linear regression is just going to predict the slope of a relationship between two variables, between our independent variable and our de dependent variable. Um, it's going to predict, it's going to assume a linear relationship between these two variables and it's going to give us the slope of that line and it's going to tell us whether that line slope is statistically significant. Uh, so we're going to choose linear regression here. And for the moment, we're going to look at predicting, um, we're going to predict job performance, that ca uh, calculated job performance variable. You remember in a prior video, we averaged the job performance questions one, two, and three into a single uh, measure. So we're going to predict aggregate performance. And let's imagine that we're interested in, uh, in uh, the effect of gender, gender on performance. So we're just going to include gender here as a covariate. And it's going to give us... Uh, uh, this model here. Uh, so there's a few things. First of all, 
or R squared. I want to talk about R squared. Most most estimate uh, most models that you estimate or estimate are going to give you an R squared. Um, this is the proportion of the variance. R squared is the proportion of the variance in our dependent variable that is explained by our model by our covariates. In this case, the R squared is 0.11. Basically, 11% of the variance in performance is actually predicted by gender. That's actually quite a lot, to be honest with you. Um, uh, I mean, this is effectively saying that these in these partic in this particular data set, in this particular organization, 11% uh, of the variance in individual performance within the organization is attributed to gender, is associated with gender. Um, and we actually find that um, gender, there's a statistically significant relationship between gender and aggregate performance. It's significant at the uh, P less than 0 0.001 level. Um, so let's talk through what this, what this model is giving us. Uh, these are the model coefficients. Again, we're predicting aggregate performance. That's shown right up here at the top. And in this particular model, um, the out, there are basically two, two things that matter. First is the intercept. First is the intercept. And second is gender. Um, so let's think about, uh, let's think about this. There are two possible genders in our data set. There's zero, which represents male, and there's one, which represents female. This particular model, model is saying that on the average, um, a person whose gender is zero, or in this case male, will have a performance level of 4.86. The intercept in this case is when gender equals zero. A person with gender of one, or female, will have a performance level that is that intercept plus the coefficient on gender. So a female will on average have a performance level of 4.860 plus 0.835 or 5.695. Substantially higher. Um, practically speaking, that seems very, very significant. That seems very practically significant. And it certainly is the, the relationship here, the p-value of 0 0.001 associated with gender is also statistically significant. So that's an interesting insight, an interesting finding. Um, uh, and that's the way to interpret a, uh, a, uh, the coefficients on, on a, in a regression. Effectively, it's the intercept plus the uh, point estimate or the, the uh, coefficient associated with the covariate of interest or the independent variable in this case, the gender. Um, it's very, very easy to interpret in this case because we only have two possible values for gender. We have zero and one. If gender was a, a continuous uh, variable, the way we'd interpret this would be slightly different. Um, we would say that each increase of one on our dependent variable, gender, doesn't make sense in this context, but stick with me. Each increase of one in gender is associated with an increase of 0.835 in performance. So that's the way you would interpret this. Um, far easier to interpret when we're talking about a binary uh, independent variable, though. Um, now let's imagine that somebody comes in and says, well, um, it, you know, the, the thing about this is, is that most of the people in our company were originally female. Um, we had a lot of females in here, and it's only very recently we've had a lot of males. And we know that being a newcomer is also associated with performance in, in, to, in, in a negative way, actually. Um, that is, newcomers tend to have lower performance for a variety of obvious reasons. Um, and so the, the critique here is, well, in this particular case, um, maybe this effect is being carried by the fact that most of the men in our organization are relatively new. Uh, we can test for that. We can drop in another covariate here and control for that. We actually have an indicator. Again, it's a binary indicator for newcomer. And we can add that right here under gender in the covariates list. And we can test for the effect of gender controlling for whatever effect newcomer might or might not have on performance. So let's do that. We've selected newcomer here. We're going to drop that right in here. Uh, the model is going to run again. And look at this. We've got an intercept of 4.978. That's changed a little bit, but not much. We've still got a pretty significant association between gender and aggregate performance, and that's still 
uh, statistically significant. Now the 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 uh, the coefficient has gone down a bit, not too much, but it's gone down a bit, uh, but it's still statistically significant. And now we have this relationship associated with newcomer. And interestingly enough, it is as we've predicted. Newcomers do tend to do poorer, perform at a, at a lower level than those who are not newcomers. The binary indicator on newcomer one is associated with 0.388 lower performance. And that's significant at 0 0.012. Um, so, so we can now say that we have evidence that we can reject the null hypothesis of no relationship between gender and performance um, at P less than 0 0.001 level. And we can come up with some point estimates. We actually now, interestingly enough, have four quadrants that we can estimate. We can look at the... Um, the average performance level of a male newcomer and a male who is not a newcomer. We can also look at the average performance level of a female newcomer and a female that's not a newcomer. So your homework is to do that. Calculate using these estimates the, the average performance level for a male newcomer and not newcomer or and a female newcomer not newcomer. That's it. I'll see you next time.